Welcome back, everyone. We are now, we are joined by Raphael Hefron, our keynote speaker. Thank you, Professor Hefron, for being here today. We are looking forward to hearing what you have to say about the just transition to decarbonization. For Raphael Hefron is a professor for global energy law and sustainability at the Center for Energy, Petroleum, Mineral Law and Policy at the University of Dundee, Scotland. Professor Hefron is, is a qualified barrister at law and a graduate of both Oxford and Cambridge. His work all has a principal focus on achieving a just transition to a low carbon economy and combines a mix of energy law, policy, and economics. He has published over 130 publications of different types and is one of the most cited scholars in his field worldwide. Professor Hefron's research has involved funding from the UK National Research Councils, the EU, and through the European Commission Jean Monnet Professor Professorship Award, where he currently is a professor in the just transition to a low carbon economy. Professor Hefron has given over 100 keynote or guest lectures in 39 countries worldwide. He was elected to the Royal Society of Edinburgh Young Academy of Scotland in 2018. His teaching has also been recognized in the UK by becoming a senior fellow of the UK Higher Education Academy in 2018. In addition, he is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Professor Hefron is a research associate at the National UK Energy Research Center and has given expert advice to the EU, UN, World Bank, and various international think tanks. He currently serves on the UNECE Group of Experts on Clear Electricity Systems. He is a reviewer for the next IPCC report. Professor Hefron uh, Professor Raphael is on the editorial board of the International Energy Law Review, the Renewable Energy Law and Policy Review, and is consulting editor of the current Halsbury Law of England volumes on energy law. He is also a trained barrister at law and was called to the bar in July 20, uh, 2007 in the Republic of Ireland. He holds degrees in the University of Cambridge, University of Oxford, the University of St. Andrews, and Trinity College of Dublin. We welcome you and the floor is yours, Professor. Thank you. And uh, uh, thank you for the, uh, first of all, the invitation. And thank you for the uh, extended introduction there. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here with you all. And I think as was said at the start of the day, it's unfortunate that it couldn't happen in person and we you know would all be there as a group together and we would be able to see uh what i hear is a very beautiful part of the united states in the fall um so i will begin soon and i i suppose i you know as a i will be i think i have a a good time period to speak so i should have a glass of water i got a nice uh, present in the post today of some Vermont uh, University uh, memorabilia, let's say. So I will um, share the screen. So hopefully it'll come up soon. Okay, and Antonia, could you confirm that that is uh, visible? Yes, I can see your screen. Thank you. So um, I will begin and, you know, I'm going to talk today about achieving a just transition to a low carbon economy by 2050. So um, it was already introduced, you know, who I am. So I'm not going to say too much more except for that uh, you can see there at the bottom, I've been a visiting fellow or a professor in different institutions around the world, Oxford, Cambridge, MIT over there in the US, uh, Texas, Queen Mary, London, Paris, West Indies, Mozambique, Colombia, uh, Australia, and a few others. And uh, why I mentioned that is I will be giving you, let's say, or 
aiming to give you a global perspective on this issue of a just transition to a low carbon economy. And I welcome any types of questions uh, at the end. So think about your questions. And uh, I believe there is uh, time to ask those at the very end. So um, as was mentioned earlier, I'm coming from the Center for Petroleum uh, for Energy, Petroleum, Mineral Law and Policy at the University of Dundee. And you can see here in the map of, uh, you have the UK and also uh, Ireland, where I'm originally from. But you can see the UK and uh, Dundee. And I suppose why our centre was created all those years ago was because, you know, across, um, well, just next to the coast there, in terms of Dundee is where you have a lot of the oil and gas of the UK. And that is, you know, why the center was created essentially. And, you know, in terms of a just transition to a low carbon economy, one of the big features for us here in Scotland is also that just transition issue that we have to phase out from this uh, somewhat reliance on oil and gas and move towards a low carbon economy so it is an issue here but i do want to highlight you know for those who are thinking you know when times are better you can think of dundee if you haven't been here already and i just wanted to mention some us media which highlight dundee as a top place to visit so the lonely planet guide for those of you who are feeling like uh, maybe traveling next year or maybe in two years after you finished your jd degree then also uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, a good uh, place to find some energy news. And Bloomberg, a very good place to find uh, data on uh, clean energy. And the new energy finance team there provides a lot of energy. So you can come along to Dundee, one of the top places in the world to visit. And not only that, you can get to hear you know, some of the top views in energy law and policy, we have been going for 43 years uh, to date already. And we've had students from around 150 different nationalities uh, over those 43 years. And hopefully uh, the pandemic, uh, you know, a solution is happens and we can continue to accept students from around the world. So when I was asked to be the keynote for today's event, I was of course honored. But I was also given the task, I was told the, that I should give the task of providing an interesting and also uplifting message. And to do that on this topic of the just transition to a low carbon economy by 2050. But back when I was asked, I was expecting to be able to visit, uh, to go to the US um, and how times have changed and, you know, all across the world, we want to see more uplifting messages at these times. So hopefully, um, you know, after my presentation, um, you will feel uh, more uplifted as you can be at these times. So I will begin and, you know, everyone will know this iconic image, um, you know, of this famous city. And I suppose it is a city, uh, it is not flooded, but this is obviously imagining a future scenario. And you could think, what if New York was flooded? And, you know, I'm sure if I was there in person, I would, I would potentially hear some people say, well, there is a certain man in the Trump Towers. And, um, you know, if New York was flooded, um, you know, it may... Um, you know, ruin some of his business, et cetera, in the Trump Towers. But, you know, we can think of this issue as being something that would have worldwide appeal if, if New York was flooded. Um, and it would be something that would be all over the news everywhere in the world. But when we think of energy, environment, sustainability, climate change issues, what we have to be thinking is, you know, they are all connected. And, you know, that's one of the points I'm trying to get across in terms of this just transition to a low carbon economy by 2050. We do have to think about the issues that are connecting together. And I like the way in the first session, different people were focusing on that 
you know, big connection between particularly energy and climate change. And when we remember the greenhouse gases, who, which cause a lot of the climate change, you know, it is methane and in particular CO2, they are produced from the, ener from the energy sector, uh, you know, in different areas, transport, electricity, industry, etc. But, you know, primarily a lot of the majority of greenhouse gas emissions are coming as a result of what happens in the energy sector. And I should say I'm taking a broad notion of what the energy sector is. I take take the broad notion that the ener energy sector is made up of each part of the energy life cycle, which is going from energy extraction to production to operation and supply to consumption, where we as consumers get in, and then to waste management. So we take energy as meaning those five uh, core activities and everything associated with them. But, you know, if we think of uh, this big city of New York and what would happen if, um, you know, this city was under threat. And then you can think of this other uh, romantic city in uh, Europe. Uh, some of you will recognize it as Venice. So, you know, if you like, I'm taking you on a tour of different uh, romantic cities across the world. So from beautiful Dundee, which I said is, you know, one of the top places to visit to uh, Venice. And maybe for some, you know, New York uh, can be romantic as well. But in terms of Venice, you can see already different issues are affecting the city of Venice around because of climate change. And you can see here this young couple uh, who were on their honeymoon. You know, their honeymoon is ruined by, you know, the floods in Venice as a result of climate change. But when we are thinking, you know, let's say most of us here from our lawyer perspective or from, you know, an economics or management type of perspective, sustainability maybe for some who are attending today, that we, can, we can think that, you know, there are many issues at play here. And one of the biggest ones you can think of is obviously for the city of Venice and the locality, the people, there is a reduction in tourism. Another thing is there is a change to, you know, the way of doing business. Businesses will find it harder to obtain insurance year on year, and eventually more will have, you know, businesses will have to exit uh, the market. And, you know, again, that will have an effect on the population. But if we think of these effects, you know, these effects are actually happening in already in reality at a wide scale, but maybe they don't see the attention that they should do. And we can see this, you know, in these images from the city of Jakarta in Indonesia, and the greater population of Jakarta has 28 million people. And when we think of the timeline I announced at the start in terms of the focus of this talk 2050, it was announced last year that in that Jakarta will be underwater by 2050. So imagine the exercise facing the government in Indonesia to try and relocate 28 million people. They have already announced last year as well where the new capital of Jakarta will be. But this is a huge, huge operation. And you think, you know, that this is finally or maybe this is a, re a big realization across the world that things are happening so uh, professor baker mentioned earlier you know uh, issues where you know we are coming coming in society to a reckoning point on uh, several issues well i would say you know we can add to that you know this particular issue of you know what is happening in some of our cities across the world and there is change happening and this is really forcing policymakers to think you know this these energy and climate change issues are not going away and we are going to have to take action so you know when we think of this achieving a just transition to a low carbon economy by 2050 we can utilize uh, this, what I describe as a just framework. And what's involved in a just framework? Well, essentially, it is a method that I will go through in a while. 
I will then, in terms of my talk, talk about the definition and journey of the just transition. I will provide you with a few key, key case studies. I'll provide a key question that I would like people to consider. And maybe, you know, you can consider it for some of the questions. Um, or alternatively, you can, you know, ask me uh, those questions or it can be part of the debate after the talk. And then I will talk a bit about justice today and then some of the next steps that I see. But what is the framework that I'm looking at this issue through? This is the JUST framework, and here is an infographic of how it works. Uh, the JUST framework, the JUST uh, stands for Justice, Universal, Space, and Time. So what we are thinking about in terms of justice are three cornerstones of justice, distributional justice, procedural justice, which was mentioned several times in the first session, and also restorative justice. Universal justice, we are thinking of recognition justice, and again, I think uh, the final speaker of the morning and an er uh, I think a couple of earlier speakers mentioned the issue of local communities, but also indigenous communities and we, how we need to give them recognition. And then also cosmopolitanism, another form of justice, which I will touch on later. Then the third part of the just framework uh, is space. And here we are thinking about where is this activity going on. And I like the way that, um, you know, Professor Baker identified with the scenario that uh, when she was down in Mexico, that this was, you know, a realization that something was going on here. And I think it's very important to realize, you know, when we think about the energy sector, we need to begin to think about who is feeling the effects of carbon dioxide. And it's not always where. Um, you know, we think we also need to think about, you know, from a wider perspective, who is feeling the effects of the different products we use, the global supply chains of business and where those effects are being felt. And then the fourth element of this just framework is time. So we are thinking about, you know, 2030, 20, 2050, 2080. 2080, et cetera. We are thinking about those different uh, periods in time. And, you know, particularly for, I know there are several disciplines here today and some, you know, economists, um, you know, who do work in terms of some of the timelines. But let's say for lawyers, we need to be thinking about 2030, 2040, 2050. If the law is not in place for 2030, we are not going to achieve our 2040 or 2050 objectives. So we need to really think about, you know, law takes a long time to get through the different houses or, you know, parts of the chains of government. If we need to go through different layers of administration, we may need to start working on an issue now in order for it to be effective in 2030. You know, so we need to realize if we are to achieve our objectives, you know, sometimes we have to plan, we have to begin planning in a more serious way ahead in terms of time. And we have to ensure that other disciplines such as economics, management, engineers, environmental scientists are aware of these, uh, you know, the way, the, if you like, the issue of the pub public administrative law, how long these t things will take to be, you know, go from being policies to actually being enforceable uh, legislation. So that, in a nutshell, is the just uh, framework. And in terms of thinking about the different forms of justice within that framework that I mentioned that covered the first two elements, the J and the U, just justice and universal. We think of the different forms of justice, distributive. Um, you know, we can, there are many elements of distributive, but we can think about distributive being, you know, there is a big issue in terms of the cost of energy. Is it fair for consumers? We can also think about the revenue from the energy sector again. You know, what are the tax rates for these big companies, etc. Procedural was touched on earlier on, you know, the different steps uh, in order to do things 
uh, you know, just as I mentioned, in order to get change or law through the system, recognition in terms of recognizing the rights in particular of local communities and or indigenous communities, restorative, restoring something back to its original state, restorative justice, I believe, is a big topic of research uh, across the discipline of law at, in Vermont. Um, and we can think of very much the idea of restorative justice coming from criminal law. We have to return the victim to their original state. And that's what we should be thinking about in terms of the energy sector. And then there is a fifth one that I had mentioned before, and that is cosmopolitan justice. And in a way, cosmopolitan justice, something that we need in terms of having a global perspective to this issue of a just transition to a low carbon economy. And it should be not distorted by, you know, the cocktail cosmopolitan or even the magazine. Maybe, you know, if we had been there in Vermont, a few, a few people would have been indulging in a cosmopolitan cocktail, but we will not be uh, perhaps tonight. But in terms of what really and where the word cosmopolitan originated from, it is from a Greek philosopher uh, several thousand years ago who said, you know, he was he was a citizen of the world when asked where he was from. And that's what we need to think about when we're talking about the just transition to a low carbon economy. We are all citizens of the world. You know, we we as humans, we were the ones who constructed these, these ideas of having nations and states. And we, th we have to think, you know, from this global perspective, we do want to keep the world within this 1.5 to 2 degree limit. That's what we have you know, signed up for. And from that perspective, we should all be thinking we are citizens of the world. So we can actually see more recently that this perspective of a citizen of the world is actually coming through in some countries. And we can see in Australia, um, and you can see here the link to nature, you know, the top journal is reporting on this issue. And for me, this, you know, is also marking a change, which I'll come back to later as well, that more and more of these top academic research journals are talking about issues of law and justice. And I think this is a great time for those of you in the audience, you know, all those JDs and, you know, who are thinking about, you know, the next step in your career. Well, I would say never before have so many people in the you know in the sector of energy and the discipline of energy wanted to connect with lawyers and you can see this case reference here for lawyers that will be very familiar but for non-lawyers they can go and consult this uh, case and you can read the decision of the judge of the australian court more clearly but if you read the the judgment the the judge says that you know one of the reasons for not giving this coal mine permission was that Australia did not want to be responsible for the carbon dioxide that would be burned from the coal that would be uh, sent, would be uh, exported out of Australia and burned in other parts of the world. And Australia did not want to be responsible for something coming out of Australia that would be burnt and producing CO2 in other parts of the world. Well, I could hear some of you say, well, you know, maybe that's an easy decision for Australia to make. Australia is a relatively wealthy country. It is classified by the World Bank as a high income country. So, of course, they can afford to do it. Well, also last year, there was a big decision in Kenya and a coal project was stopped. And again, you know, OK, it wasn't in a fully similar way in terms of them being worried about fully concerned about the impact globally but there was you know that was one of the concerns that there would be uh, a lot of co2 produced a lot more potentially than was said in the environmental impact assessment and as a result despite let's say kenya needing more energy supply to have more economic growth they chose not to uh, you know give permission for this project so this marks a change you know, we can even think about the change in terms of a philosophy towards economic growth. No longer does a developing country think in a certain way to say, well, it's economic growth at all costs. And this is a reflection on, let's say, being able to judge 
the data that we can see is coming from fossil fuel infrastructure and being able to link that to damage, you know, the damage, environmental damage, the public health damage, and the general contribution to, let's say, the climate change debate. And again, I will touch briefly on that later. So in terms of the space issue of the just framework, I just wanted to give you this example of, you know, this is what we're talking about when we talk about the space issue and you can narrow this issue from an international perspective to a national or even a local perspective you want to be thinking about what are all the impacts of a certain activity and here is one let's say the production of cobalt which is produced you know for you know our mobile phones or our computers and here you can see the democratic republic of congo the cobalt coming out of there going over to China, going to Europe, and then going to the USA, where we, we are consumers in you know uh, high-income countries, let's say of South Korea, Japan, Europe, the US. We are consuming that product. And just to give you a different example of you know the tax rate for cobalt is in effect 1.5% in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But yet these technology companies are earning you know 15 to 20% you know profit of you know that is profit that they are making on those products. And what you would have to think about is in terms of, you know, why is there such an imbalance in terms of the distribution of, you know, who wins in terms of this type of energy resource? And there's, an, there's even secondary issues here that we should be concerned about. You know, there are 50, 60,000 children who are uh, child minors in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I would just point you to, you know, anyone who has not read the energy book that uh, Joel Eisen, the first speaker today, was, is, uh, I think, the lead editor of. You know, the first chapter in that book talks about eras of energy law. And let's say um, a couple of us here from Europe, uh, we have our own version we talk about you know, the evolution or stages of the evolution of energy law. But anyway, I think they are both interesting articles. But within both articles, you can see, you know, both chart the history of why we introduced essentially energy law. And if you if you look at those articles, you can see, you know, part of the reason we first had energy law was in particular, one of the reasons was the issue of health and safety, because a lot of people were dying down the mines for commercial, you know, the first operation of commercial scale coal. And if we think about, you know, what is happening today, we have, you know, children miners again, exactly like we did, you know, 150 to 200 years ago in, you know, the developed world. And we have the same problem now in the developing world. And, you know, you could ask, how have we improved as a society when we have exactly the same problem happening for a different type of energy resource that we're taking out of the ground? So again, we think about the space issue and are we having justice across global supply chains for the different products, for the different effects? And equally, you know, you could do a distribution issue in terms of who's feeling the effect of the CO2 in this uh, global supply chain and this global industry for electronic uh, equipment. And then in terms of timelines, we can think of these various timelines. What is happening at these timelines? Well, we can think of 2030 timeline is very important, which I'll say why in a few minutes. 2040, you can lead, read a lot of reports that say there will be 44 trillion in new energy investment by 2040. Then we have the timeline of 2050, which many countries are already planning for. And then we also have a 2060 timeline, which again, many countries are already planning for. And you can see the recent announcement by China of their energy and climate goals by 2060. So the influence of China will definitely change or influence other countries to start working towards uh, these timelines as well, if they weren't before. So. In terms of the just transition issue, what do I mean in terms of uh, the just transition to a low carbon economy? Well, we are talking about a societal shift. 
And we are talking not just about what happens within the energy sector itself, but we are talking about the big and very broad impact of the energy sector on society. The energy sector is, you know, alongside health, you know, is one of the biggest areas of our global economy. And, you know, you can say the same at a national level in all countries worldwide. We also are thinking a bit more about, you know, because we're thinking about the broad impact of the energy sector on society, we are thinking about, you know, we have to link it to more and more issues such as labour, such as health, such as industrial policy of our countries, etc. So there are some different types of definitions that you will see in the academic literature. There are the views of it is convergence of issues around environment, energy and climate change. You will also see it commonly uh, spoken about in terms of the workforce transition. I just put in the ILO there. The international, uh, the ILO is an international labour organisation that has uh, been talking about the just transition for uh, over a decade. And then uh, you will also see the reference of, you know, this is really about ensuring that no one is left behind. You know, it's not just good enough to talk about an energy transition. We want to make sure that this is a just uh, transition to a low carbon economy. We are going beyond just a simple energy transition. An energy transition may leave us in the same place before in terms of you know the, the different inequalities that we have in society, uh, but we just have changed our you know energy mixes to be low carbon. We want to make sure that no one is left behind in this transition and that we end up with a more uh, just, uh, society. And as part of that, you know, one of the immediate issues that has risen, you know, really brought this just transition issue to the attention of policymakers, to society, to industry, to business, is the uh, Paris Agreement. And you can see on this uh, picture uh, the Louvre Museum. And I think, you know, this is a very important uh, agreement. And, you know, Paris is a very important place for many lawyers. Many of you will uh, have probably gone over on holiday there as lawyers, and you will probably have brought your suit down. Again, if I, if I was able to ask questions to a live audience, I could ask, you know, wh what does anyone know the name or know why uh, the Louvre Museum is um, the, very popular for lawyers and why lawyers bring their suit over to uh, Paris whenever they go on holiday and they wear it down into the Louvre Museum. They go, I think, around two floors down in the Louvre Museum and that is where one of the oldest legal agreements is. So one of the there's different contracts written on this stone, the Hammurabi uh, stone that you can see uh, in the Louvre Museum. So it's only quite right that, you know, a very famous uh, agreement was signed in Paris the Paris COP21 agreement, and hopefully the US remains in this agreement, uh, and I guess we will find out next month, but hopefully the US remains part of this. And I think, uh, for me, the big thing about the Paris Agreement is that 188 countries signed and ratified this agreement in the space of three and a half years. You know, never before have so many countries signed and ratified a, a, an agreement uh, so fast in, you know, in my view. And there are some will say, well, there isn't actually that much binding in, in this agreement. Well, I would say, well, it does make countries have an energy and climate agreement and, you know, by 2030. So again, going back to those uh, timelines. But if we're to think about the just transition journey, we can see, you know, the just transition is mentioned, is contained within the Paris Agreement, but it remained relatively dormant um, until around 2017. And we must remember that the Paris Agreement is, you know, a science-backed agreement, which partly explains maybe why so many countries signed and ratified it so quickly, that it is based on the science. And, you know, I believe 99% of scientists worldwide accept you know, this climate change science. And then, you know, in continuing this journey in 2018, we had the G7 talks, and again, they even referred specifically to the just transition. So this began to put it out there in terms of policymakers, and they included it in the communique after that uh, G G7 uh, talks. 
And then in 2019, we saw different countries around the world begin to look at law and policy solutions for the just transition to try and force legal change. And I just give an example here of some countries. I do include the US there. It's more from maybe not the US from a federal level, but there are different states in the US who are who have uh, early, uh, you know, are looking at just transition issue. And then we think of 2020, it evolved and, you know, uh, different countries are beginning to put financial funds behind the Just Transition Initiative to try and develop uh, the Just Transition Initiative. So, one of these examples in terms of the, uh, you know, the money behind the Just Transition Initiative is that the EU itself, through what they call its its initiative, is the Just Transition Mechanism. They have committed to 150 billion. Uh, of expenditure from 2021 to 2027. So a big sum in trying to encourage a just transition to a low carbon economy. In Germany, we see that they have sort of focused their just transition on a coal commission. They are planning to phase out coal by 2038. They have set up a new unit, which they call the Commission on Growth, Structural Change and Employment. And they are potentially, I don't think it's fully agreed yet, but they are potentially going to fund it by 1.3 billion per year for 20 years. Um, and then there are initiatives in smaller states like New Zealand and Scotland. Um, and here in Scotland, we have what was is called a Just Transition Commission set up in 2019. It is sort of in the, external to the Department of Energy and Climate Change. Whereas in New Zealand, it is a Just Transition unit. It is contained within the government department there and there are just some questions there these are at the formative stage you know if we're lawyers we ask the question of you know what may be the impact of these units you know what are their powers who are the members what are the goals and targets you know are the powers etc and targets going to be binding and these are yet these are questions yet to be determined so in a way we are on, on course to try and sort of uh bring more legislation, bring more power behind this Just Transition initiative. So when we think of 2050 as a goal, we are, you know, in different countries around the world, we are taking steps to achieve that. Well, you know, we do have to look on the, you know, we can't always be, let's say, optimistic. We, have, we do have to look on the downside. And I said, you know, I would ask a, a question that I would like people to consider for you know the remainder of the talk and obviously to consider into the future and anyone who's interested in this question you know or you think you know there could be some good research here feel free to reach out to me you know and I'd be happy to hear from you and see how we could progress on this idea you know and one of the difficulties of a just transition you know is to ask you know I talked about the five forms of justice you know who is this just transition for and again, we think back to the earlier panel of people talking about energy justice specifically. You know, we think who is, you know, the justice for within the energy sector and this just transition. We're thinking maybe in an even, even more broad way. And, you know, what I would ask is, want to, you know, tell you is one of the difficulties of the just transition that we're seeing around the world. And to give you the example from Germany. So Germany has stated in its just transition plans it will phase out coal by 2038 well that is a long long time to wait 2038 you know some of us uh, some of us speakers you know uh, we may have retired by 2038 um, and some of you getting your jds here today you know even you know even you may be considering what's going to happen or you know in your own careers you know are you looking at retirement in five or ten years this is a long long time and you think in terms of you know climate change issues can we afford to wait but if you remember the figure i said uh, i think it was 1.3 billion per year that germany was going to support this just transition is that not actually saying we are going to subsidize coal in Germany until 2038 by nearly 1.3 billion per year. And I would ask the question, yes, it's a good thing to phase out coal. 
but what message is that sending to oil and gas and does that mean we are going to it's going to take even longer to phase out oil and gas and we will subsidize the the phase out of oil and gas what happened to letting the market work and the market decide on these issues and i would just point to the example in the us that you know under the obama administration that there were certain uh, regulatory environmental regulations put in in terms of the clean air act and in the space of 5 years coal assets plummeted in value from 85 plummeted in value by 85% i mean what what happens to letting the market decide and you know letting these industries uh, be phased out by the market rather than uh, subsidizing them so there is a big question to be asked in terms of the difficulty of achieving a just transition in terms of some of the policy mechanisms that countries are looking at at the moment but you know although we can think of that maybe negative in terms of the just transition we can also think that you know there are other issues happening at the moment and dr baker or sorry professor baker highlighted some of those earlier but I would like to add to those and, you know, from my perspective, I call this sort of maybe a perfect storm of events. And I think these are sort of there are various accelerants that have been acting for, you know, nearly a decade or just a bit longer than a decade um, that are really bringing justice to the fore. And these are issues such as economics, because the discipline of economics has gone through its own crisis, taxation issues disclosure transparency insurance environmental impact assessment reg legislation has changed around the world the un sustainable development goals are receiving a lot of attention the paris agreement itself i said and i think COVID 19 is a further accelerant that is making us to begin thinking a bit more about all of these issues and you only need to see the different uh policy reports i read one from uh, the from the, uh, I think it was the Caribbean, uh, the Latin American and Caribbean Development Bank. There is the reports from the Asian Development Bank, the International Agent Energy Agency, the OECD, uh, Mult World Bank, multiple reports stating, you know, how we have to have a green and sustainable economic recovery. And, you know, these are all, you know, calling for no one to be left behind, which fits very much with the justice narrative that we are talking about here and i can just touch on some of these you know economics is changing after the last economic crisis at 07 to 09 we can see the big impact that has had on society in terms of economics that has you know risen in terms of you know uh stiglitz jan Tirol, two nobel prize winning e economists and also piketty who has been mentioned in the last few years that he is on the verge of winning a nobel prize for his work on inequality, but also for those who are interested, you should read Piketty's work on CO2 emissions, where he joined up, I think, with environmental scientists. And they show that those uh, inequality, you know, the more CO2 you produce, the more inequality you will have in society. And that's why I think we have to reflect on the message of it's not good enough to give countries the opportunity to, to build more CO2 producing infrastructure, because what we are saying to them is, then you are going to have more societal inequality by doing so. So we have to change the infrastructure that we use to address the societal inequality issue. We can also think about, you know, since that financial crisis, we have the issues of the Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, and you can see if you read those books, they're relatively inexpensive online, and you can see the references to the energy companies within those. And in terms of the risks, we can uh, identify these risks in terms of project development and relate them to justice. And I just identify these here uh, again in this infographic, uh, you know, I'll be happy to share or the, the slides can be shared after, but I'll be happy to share the infographic. And we talk about these as being justice risks around taxation, economics, project finance, EIAs, bankruptcy, you know, the rise in data, imagery, foreign investment rules, climate change, etc. And we see these different risks coming in terms of the planning, construction, operation and decommissioning phases of an energy project. 
And, you know, that links in with, you know, the importance, you know, let's say of the energy sector. We, and we think about uh, some of the research here that I just quote from a Nature Energy paper published uh, just around two years ago. Uh, Nature Energy, I think, is the most cited journal in the world. So even, uh, I think, has a higher citation score than Nature itself. Um, but that article argues that if you solve the energy sustainable development goal number seven, you will go a long way to resolving all the other sustainable development goals, all the other 16 sustainable development goals. So something worth remembering, and I would encourage you to have a read of that paper. And I just want, wanted to point out very briefly, I don't go into too much that on COVID-19, but I, as I said, COVID-19 is another accelerator to what I think was already happening before. You know, COVID-19 is building on the momentum that was there before. And I just want to point out some figures in terms of, you know, with COVID-19, and this was touched on uh, briefly by uh, the, in the first panel. And when we think these figures are from Lancet, so a very reliable source, and, you know, in terms of pollution, the economists would be aware of this uh, type of figures use that 6.2% of global economic output is lost per year um, because of pollution. And this is why uh, policymakers are beginning to, to look at another way of having economic growth is to think about, well, we can actually... Uh, reduce the impact of pollution on our economic growth and that means you know overall our economic growth should go up so it is another way of achieving economic growth but also we can look at this figure nine million premature debts which account for 16 percent of all global debts per year are pollution related and this is from again from uh, the lancet data and the Lancet, for those interested in health and climate change and energy data, is a very, very good source, so do consult it. And, you know, if we take this figure of 16%, we round it up to 20%, we could make the cynical calculation uh, that one out of every five, five of us, you know, on today's call, you know, will die as a result of, you know, some uh, potential impact on pollution. Obviously, that would be, on average, one out of every five of us. Um, so, you know, I just want to finish with some reflections for the future. And in this, you know, the just transition to a low carbon economy, it has been described as, you know, the greatest societal challenge of our time. And that was, let's say, pre-COVID. But we can think that this, you know, still remains, you know, the big societal challenge of our time. I don't think COVID is you know going to prevent it from being the biggest societal challenge of our time these issues are still and remain ongoing and you know we are all stakeholders in the energy sector as i said earlier the energy sector being the biggest contributor uh, to you know this issue and as stakeholders we all have a key role to play and you know i would ask the question are we all doing enough individually is there enough happening and, you know, what I would say to you is, you know, we can see this image here of a very elderly couple walking down the street. And I know that, you know, this is a, a journal, you know, an annual event for a journal operated by the students of uh, Vermont. And I would say, you know, that I would encourage you to be, you know, you know, the young generation to me is needed. We need your ideas. And, you know, we need as this... Uh, let's say image of the girl in color is coming up and challenging, you know, the ideas of the older generation. And that's what we need, you know, no longer does the current framework work. We need a new framework to deliver this just transition to a low carbon economy. And it is up to you and your young generation to provide us with uh, good ideas to take uh, forward. And I would f also say, you know, like never before, you know, for all the young lawyers there today, you know, there is huge, huge opportunity, I think, for you in the energy sector today. And I just point out these key interdisciplinary energy journals, 
Some of you will be aware of them before on your research and some of the other academics today. Nature Energy has the topic of energy justice listed as a topic that they will accept articles on. Applied Energy, one of the you know one of the highest impact factor energy journals uh, outside of Nature Energy, you know again uh, had a special issue on energy justice. Again, energy policy the same. Energy research and social science publishes a lot on energy justice, and I would just point you to the fact that. 95%, I would say, of the articles you will find in energy justice in those interdisciplinary journals, they are written by non-lawyers. Uh, you know, the, the lead author is a non-lawyer. And I think, you know, this, this is so unusual. Never before have so many other scholars from other disciplines wanted to engage on the ideas of justice. And I think this is a great opportunity. And as lawyers, we should all be publishing a lot more on these justice issues, because I can tell you, reading some of the articles, it's quite clear, you know, some of them are not making the effort to fully engage in the ideas or the philosophy, the jurisprudence of justice that we as lawyers are very, very familiar with. So we have a duty to educate the other disciplines in order to make sure we can achieve, you know, ideas behind the behind energy justice and ensure that there can be a just transition to a low carbon economy. And I just, uh, you know, here's an infographic on a just transition to a low carbon economy. Again, I'll be happy to share with anyone who wants to utilize this. So I just finish uh, on that note. Um, there's my email if anyone wants to get in touch. And I hope, you know, I have left you with some. Uh, ways of thinking about what you can do uh, in your future careers and there are positives out there there are things happening and you know there are opportunities and places for where we can put our ideas and put our work to good effect and i just leave you with that quote from michelangelo and encourage you all that despite these times you know we should still aim higher and higher so thank you very much Thank you so much, Professor. That was a really great conversation about the just transition to decarbonization. We have about eight minutes for questions, and we have a few questions coming in from the chat. So, um, so one of the questions is, what advice do you give, do you have for students or even current practitioners in the states who want to get involved in this kind of work on the international level or even keep the United States involved in Paris if we do pull out? Um, I think that um, there, are, there are several opportunities as lawyers. So one, uh, there's opportunities to uh, engage on international, you know, international sort of committees, international meetings. Let's say one in particular is the International Bar Association. They have quite a big energy uh, division. They have uh, like uh, they have energy, climate change. There's one on mining. There's one on infrastructure, which has an energy focus. So there are opportunities to gauge on those on that sort of professional aspect yourself. Uh, there's also opportunities to continue engage and sort of represent, uh, you know, professional the professional energy sector on a range of different energy. Uh, climate change, environment, sustainability uh, meetings, let's say at the UN level, uh, at the World Bank level, um, at the development bank, other development banks, you know, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia. So there are different meetings happening all over the world that you just have to begin to sign up for and, you know, begin to engage and, you know, business commercial law is becoming more and more international and I would encourage uh, people thinking of their careers to leave that door open in your career and begin to think about well how do I sign up uh, what are the big institutions operating in Asia uh, you know the uh, let's call it Latin America and Africa or Europe whichever you know, whichever is your dream and whichever is your wish. And I would say one of the advantages 
you know, of the energy sector is, you know, ultimately there are global supply chains operating in the energy sector. So by getting involved, um, you know, and showing that you are interested internationally, that may give you opportunities to travel and get out there and make a difference. Great, thank you. Another question from a um, viewer is, in order for us to have a more just society, there will need to be, clo be closures of fossil fuel plants. Does this, this will require the construction of a very large number of new renewable energy facilities and associated transmission and storage infrastructure. What are your thoughts on and or what are some solutions that you can give to communities who want renewable energy facilities that are facing local opposition? Um, I, I think, uh, you know, some of the answers are, as was mentioned earlier, you know, about the issue of educating and ensuring people have the full knowledge. And I think, you know, no matter what energy source we build, there will always be a problem. You know, um, some people refer to it as the Faustian pact that, you know, there isn't any uh, best way of delivering uh, some, you know, energy to the consumer. But what I would say in terms of local energy development, you know, it needs to be displayed properly and coherently that, you know, Renewable energy has huge, huge significant advantages over other forms of energy. It doesn't intrude on their lives as much. And also with the potential for technological development, in particular, you mentioned the issue of energy storage, the options through energy storage, energy, uh, utilizing energy batteries um, or battery technology, utilizing artificial intelligence, uh, and, you know, let's say newer, even newer technology around uh, energy efficiency, you know, we will be able to reduce consumer bills by around 60%. There are already test cases happening in different parts of the world which show you can actually reduce the bill for consumers by six, around 60%, and they have tested these out on small communities. And the only reason that they haven't been able to roll these out is because of uh, regulators or governments deciding that they don't want to have this rollout uh, across a whole city or region because they are afraid that there will be too many jobs lost in the traditional energy sector. So it comes down to, you know, we do want to on one hand, some of the techn this technology is already available, but on another hand, we have to keep uh, jobs. And, you know, you know, it's a difficult choice for policymakers that on one hand, they want to continue to subsidize jobs in the old technologies, but yet they don't want to allow these full new technologies to fully grow and develop. And what I would leave you with the thought is in terms of that issue if i if i said to you you should take old types of solutions for covid 19 as a as a cure you would say no no i want the new drugs and you only have to look at president trump he didn't take his old solution of um you know injecting himself with uh, you know the cleaning fluid he apparently got the latest uh, drug cocktail to help him through covid 19 so my view would be when we think of the impact of the energy sector on our own public health, increasingly we have the data, why are we letting ourselves be open to a second rate solution when the first rate solution is actually already out there? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so our last question is, do you believe the new SEC rules for mandatory annual financial risk disclosure requirements for those engaged in significant mining operations will affect the en energy transition considering the need for storage? Um, I. I think they could affect uh, the energy transition in, in a very positive way. And 
Um, I had the the infographic up there towards towards the end about the different risks, um, and I I think that that is a a big plus. But it's about how the risk is quantified. But what I would hope is the financial community begin to start quantifying. Well, this is a huge risk. There are big risks out here if we do nothing. So irrespective of what future regulation comes out that the financial community essentially say these projects uh, particularly obviously uh, fossil fuel projects are becoming far far too risky and we begin to see a big push towards less risky low carbon energy projects and by less risky i include nuclear uh, hydro and all the type, different types of renewable energy, as well as all types of energy efficiency technology and smart technology. Great. So we have a few minutes left, and one more question did come in, and I'll let you answer it and have the final word. So, from your extensive travels and positions throughout our planet, have you noticed whether one particular country or region? Has young people more engaged or mobilized fighting for a just transition? If so, what advice do you have for us with mobilizing young people in the United States even more based on what you have seen in other countries or regions? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question to uh, single out. Um, you know, I, I may not be welcome back in certain countries, certain countries, uh, by not giving, giving them a, uh, a mention, but, um, you know, what I would say is when we are researching, um, issues in energy law and, uh, you know, I've, I've written a small book on energy law for anyone who's, you know, interested I, I will be happy to share it by email for anyone who wants a copy. I'm sure it's ava available in your library. But when I, when I look at energy law, and let's say the, these will be my closing points as well. When I look at energy law, you have to do it in a comparative way. So, you know, I think you have to go back to, I think the World Bank classifications are quite useful to think about high income to think about, you know, the two classifications in in uh, middle income countries and then low income countries. So it would be unfair of me to say, well, you know, there are particular places where the just transition is really kicking off, um, or you know, in a way that let's say different movements. I mean, some countries you are defined by the income level in that country. Others, you are defined by the space as part of the just transition framework, that space issue. You have different geographies. Some countries have no access to uh, a coastline. You know, what happens in, in a landlocked country is very different. And equally, you know, if I'm looking at the US, there is differences if you're in the mid US to, you know, if you are on the coast, there are different regions which are hotter, which are colder. Um, some have better access to more efficient uh, potential for wind or solar so to me it's really about the better countries and to you know not to say any examples but there are some examples from some of the leading nations in uh, both africa i would say and in south america where they are focusing on the education of young people on these issues so they are trying to encourage the young people to think about energy, climate change, environment, and say, look, we need change here. A lot of change is linked to technology. Um, and the better you are able to understand technology, uh, be a bit more interdisciplinary, um, you know, you may be able to provide solutions for, uh, you know, their country. And what I would say, the message for uh, you out, out there for you today uh, as students of the US is, you know, not to accept, um, you know, some of the opinions, let's say, of often of the, let's say, the older generation. The older ge generation have delivered you into a system like you have today. So you have to begin to challenge that system. 
And one of the ways that we can challenge that system is utilizing technology. And I think more and more as students of, let's say, tomorrow's world, you have to start reading beyond the legal journals. You have to read the interdisciplinary energy journals. I gave you a few examples. You have to become familiar with data and you have to be able to have that data on your fingertips. So when, you know, let's say if you were out on the campaign trail, you are able to quote people on the data specifically. So, you know, as I was watching the debate, or not the debate, because your your president refused the second debate, but as I was watching the town hall, you know, uh, your president was challenged immediately uh, on some of the data he talked about. And it's that type of uh, challenge that we need against the cl ch climate change deniers. We need to convince people that this is increasingly very important. And again, if you follow the interdisciplinary literature, they talk about the speed of the transition. And, you know, like never before, we need to get, we will need to get legislation through parliaments, through the House, through the Senate faster than ever before. And how are you going to do that? Uh, I don't have all the solutions for you today, but maybe in time, some of the students listening today uh, and your classmates, Antonia, will think of how can you accelerate legislation through the US legal system, because that's what's needed to ensure that there is a just transition to a low carbon economy. So again, thank you, uh, Antonia, to you and your colleagues uh, for inviting me. I wish you the best in uh, the rest of your time at Vermont and in finishing uh, you know, your JDs and uh, all the best for your careers. And I left my email there, so feel free to reach out. And I think uh, in today's world, it is all about uh, reaching out and making new connections. And again, uh, you know, make those connections internationally, uh, whether it be Europe, the Middle East, Asia, Africa, uh, the Amer across the Americas, people will be in touch and will want to stay in touch like never before. So thank you and have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much for providing us with all your knowledge and insight on these topics. I couldn't agree more with your last answer, but um, we are out of time now. And so our next panel will be coming up of the Climate Goals panel. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.